can hardly declare His praise? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. So open the gates. So open up the gates. Make way. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fights in our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb. For the sin of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Yes, thank you, Lord, that you welcome us, and every knee will bow before the king. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Oh, my sing that again. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? him into his home. And Lord, I feel compelled to accept that invitation to invite you into my home. Lord, we invite
invite you into this place. We find belonging in your presence, Lord. We also felt that whatever that means for us, uh, individually and collectively, that is that is right. It can be jubilant. It can be silent. So I just encourage us to do that this morning and sing the chorus again. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Water, you turn to one open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you Unlike you, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, sing that again. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Water, you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. She shines out of the ashes. We rise. There's no one like you, none like you. Yes, Lord, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God is healer, 
Great. 
promises. We hold fast to your promises, Lord. Yeah, just before the uh, meeting, we were we met together to pray, and um, somebody prayed about actually Father's Day being quite difficult for some people, um, because their experience of their father hasn't been good, it hasn't been the things we're seeing at the moment, about faithfulness, about being there for you. Um, and I just felt just then that God was saying he wants to remind people of that, um, that as we sing through those words again, that actually he is that faithful father, um, that his promises are yes and amen, that he doesn't change his mind, he, he is faithful through whatever we are going through, whatever we're experiencing. Um, so we're going to sing through that chorus again, we're going to sing again, but as you know, if that's relevant to you, um, you know, do just ask God to show that truth to you, to remind you of that. Uh, so I just had a slightly strange picture um, as we were worshipping. So you know on a plane when there's an emergency, um, there's a release of oxygen masks from the um, lockers above your head. And you have to give it a yank, otherwise the oxygen doesn't start to flow. I just feel like God wants to release promises maybe new promises or reminders of old promises and that that I can see it above our heads those oxygen masks coming down and we just need to reach out and give it a little yank um, to release that flow of life-giving promise for, that is the word of God to us a personal word for you for me today so I'd actually just like to pray over us and um, because sometimes these prophetic things are helpful so if you just shut your eyes because nobody needs to see but I'm personally going to reach out and grasp that mask if you want to do it with me and give it a yank father we just thank you for your life giving word to us for your promises spoken of old and afresh today and I just pray that as we grasp out and give a pull down from heaven that you would release fresh word fresh promise and reminders of love spoken promises would you breathe new life into those words now as we listen to you Re release that now holy spirit release that over this room right now in the name of jesus
it's lovely to be together, isn't it? I, um, I'm having quite a good day. I, I, um, I did Wordle in three goes. That's quite good, right? Come on, who's still doing it? I, I gave up and I've just started doing it again in the last week. Um, but we are doing, starting a new series and we are really, really excited about this new series, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. You might have heard about the book, you might have got the book, you might have, um, there's about three or four different books in the series. We've been doing this as a senior leadership team over the last year and it has been fantastic and we thought now is such a good time for us as a church as a whole church to be looking at emotions to be looking at how our health is and so this whole series is an opportunity as a whole church to take a deeper dive into what it means to be human what it means to follow Jesus with all of our beings and we're basing it off this book by a guy called speak um, Pete Schizero um, I've heard about seven different variations for how you say that name, but I'm saying Pete Scazzaro. And if you like reading, do get the book, do download it on Kindle, get it on eBay, Amazon, however you want to get it. And it's a story of a pastor called Pete Scazzaro from who, well, he was a pastor and he's now given that up and he's gone and gone on this other journey of writing this resource for churches all around the world around how they can look internally and follow Jesus with all of their beings and look by looking at their emotions more intently. And he spent years doing church, years building this organization, making disciples, doing all these things God had called him to do, being busy for God. And then he realized one day that he'd missed something really important. He'd missed taking care of himself and his own health. And to many, he looked good, he looked healthy, his outer world looked great, but his inner world was not healthy at all. His marriage, he writes, was strained. He didn't have any real great friendships that he could be honest with. And he began to ask these questions. God, why is it that I'm feeling like this? Why is my soul struggling? Why is it that I'm, I'm living this message, I'm preaching this message on a Sunday and midweek and, and my life looks like this? Why aren't I feeling what I want to be feeling and what your word says I should be feeling? And this series, yes, it's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, but actually, actually it's the whole caboodle. It's the whole thing. It's our emotions. It's our mental, our physical, our spiritual health. All of these are what makes us human and all of these God cares about. Amen? Amen. Okay, the subtitle of the book captures what we're going after. It's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. It's impossible to be spiritually mature whilst remaining emotionally immature. You know, it is possible to be emotionally mature without Christ. It is possible. Just as it's possible to practice deep spiritual rhythms, i.e. be quite spiritually mature without paying attention to our emotions. But Jesus wants to bring full transformation to us. Not just our minds, not just us coming and attending and the doing side of things. He wants to bring transformation to our full beings. And emotional health, if I could put it into an equation, emotional health plus deep spirituality is the sort of transformation, it's whole life transformation that Jesus wants to give us. And this verse captures it. John 10 verse 10. This is Jesus. He says, I have come that you may have life and life in, its, in all its fullness. And I love this verse. Who loves this verse? Who claims this verse? We love the promise, don't we? We love this promise. Another translation of fullness is abundance. Who doesn't want life in all its abundance? And we have this promise and, and then we also have our reality. We have our reality. And I know that we don't need to go far and we don't need to go too many days where we aren't actually feeling like life we have it in all its fullness, do we? We're battling with fears, there's anxieties, there's all sorts of stresses, disappointments. Perhaps you're rushing around just trying to make ends meet. Perhaps you're trying to climb the ladders of success. And what we can find is actually we're not looking after ourselves. You know, we're carrying hurts, we're carrying frustrations, maybe disappointments from last week. Maybe a job we didn't get, maybe a relationship that's not worked out. Maybe it's a hurt from a decade ago. Or when we we're a child. We know the promise and we know the realities and there's this big gap. And that gap can be disillusioning, can't it? 
It can make us ask questions like, does God actually care about me? Is Jesus really the one that can give me life in all its fullness? And I think what the Lord wants to do through this six-part series, which we are really excited about, is take us by the hand and to lead us into a life in all its fullness. To start something that is going to impact not just now, but the next 10 years and beyond. So let's go into our first passage for today. It's John 7, the Feast of the Tabernacles. Feel free to find it. I'll have it on the screen as well. Uh, John 7, Feast of the Tabernacles. Now, even to this day, the Jewish community, they'll gather around for a, a couple of feasts, two, three feasts uh, throughout the year. And they, this was the Feast of the Tabernacles, seven days. And on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he said this, If anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. So Jesus rocks up at this festival. He interrupts and says, Anyone who is hurt, anyone who is thirsty, anyone who has any need, come to me. Now, I don't know what you'd be like. I mean, this was a time where all of these people were, were at this festival crying out to God as the custom was, saying, Lord, save us. And this wasn't actually the only time where God reveals his concern about well-being. Throughout the Bible, it's a theme. Genesis, God made Adam and Eve, and there's this river in the garden that brings life. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. And then Revelation 22, the end of the story that we're in eager anticipation of. You know, I can't wait. God is going to make all things new. And th there it says in Revelation 22, there is a river of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great city, the new Jerusalem. So here we have in the beginning of the story that we are part of, in the beginning there is this river of life in the Garden of Eden. And at the end there is this river of life in this great city. And we are somewhere in the middle. God is making a world. He's made a world where he's put a great river of life in it where all creation will be sustained. It has been sustained. It will be sustained. And right now it is being sustained. That river of life is his presence. It is God's presence. It is his spirit. It is his life giving presence. And in John 7, if we go back to that scripture and that passage, this is the first century. Jesus is talking to this Jewish community and they were drowning in sin. They were ruled over by this, this Roman regime and they, were, they hadn't had a prophet speak to them for about 400 years and they're thirsty, they're longing, they've been promised this messianic figure to come and save them, haven't they? And they're crying out, they're saying, God save us. And this rabbi rocks up, Jesus rocks up and says, if anyone has need, come to me. And I don't know if you, if, if you can picture yourself, but this crowd would be like, yes, take me. Like, yes, he's come. They, it wasn't quite the, the messianic figure that they were expecting. But it's interesting what Jesus then, then says. He says, if you follow me, say that I'm king. Say that I'm Lord of all. And then rivers of life will surely flow. So straight away we see that to access this river, to be fully quenched and satisfied, to have life in all its fullness, we need to decide to give Jesus all of ourselves. If we want all of what Jesus has for us, we need to give Jesus all of ourselves. All of ourselves. When we give full access to Jesus of our hearts, then he brings us life in its abundance. Proverbs 4 says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And the title of this first talk, and it's a question that I want to ask you, what is the state of your heart? What is the state of your heart? What's going on in here? Have you given Jesus access to every part of your life? You know, we all have journeys, don't we? We all have things that have shaped us and things that have shaped us for good, things that have made us, brought us character, things that have hurt us. For me, one of the most significant moments that I can think of was uh, about seven, eight years ago. And I've been leading student ministry for about 10 years and we had a great time, absolutely fantastic 10 years of doing student ministry and we planted 
I was part of a team that planted a church or a new congregation in the city centre at the Adelphi Hotel. Anyone remember that? Anyone there? What wonderful times. And we had international minist- student ministries and we saw people saved. We made this new disciples, started new ministries and communities. It was a real amazing time. And I grew loads spiritually, learned loads about Jesus. But deep down, these cracks were starting to form. Deep down, I hadn't paid attention to what was going on in here. I was riddled by anxieties. I wasn't looking after myself, so I never took real time off. It's really hard to. When you work in the weekends, I hadn't quite worked out that balance yet. I wasn't getting rest. I was getting burnt out. But no one knew about it because I was a fantastic chameleon. I was the professional. I knew how to pray. I knew how to make people laugh. I knew how to listen. And to give that little awkward side hug. From the outside, I think people thought I was successful and popular. But internally, I was a mess. I used to go home and, and Jen would be like, how was it? And I'd be like, yeah. And I got to the end of this long period. And actually, internally, I, I, I needed to be listening out to what was going on. I struggled to get out of bed. And actually, what had happened is my spirituality, my discipleship, how I was following Jesus, what I was believing... It hadn't touched a number of deep parts of me, internal wounds, sin patterns. I was really quite emotionally immature. And because of that, unfortunately, my faith nearly died. And thankfully, with a couple of friends who helped me understand what was going on, and I took some time out and uh, I saw a professional counsellor for a number of years. It was brutal, but it took me a number of years to recover. And the point I'm making is that, yes, I was developing spiritually. We can do the things that, that make us feel good or make us think that we're doing what we should be doing. We can come on a Sunday. We can attend community. We can do our devotionals. We can have our quiet times and all these things. But we can neglect our emotions. We can ignore the physical and emotional limits that God has on us. And God has blessed us. He has gifted us with limits because we can't do it ourselves, can we? In fact, we need him. And as we let Jesus into our emotions, he shows us the pace that we're meant to live. And that's one of the the weeks we're going to be looking at. He shows us how to deal with our emotions. And that's what I'm just tapping into today. He shows us that he cares about our hearts more than he does about our achievements. Emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. And I know there'll be people here with all sorts of pain to process. All sorts of things they are going through, anxieties, disappointments, maybe from this year, maybe even this week, maybe years ago. Job dissatisfaction, you know, relationship disappointments, physical issues, financial, the environment, loss of loved ones. But what we do with our pain now matters. What we do with our emotions on a daily basis matters, doesn't it? And in fact, I go as far as to say what we do with our emotions in the next couple of years could determine how we are in the next decade. And not just for us, but for those around us as well. Oh yeah, it was this one, the iceberg. So this is a picture of an iceberg. (laughs) And now, apparently, I don't know if I've seen an iceberg, but... Uh, apparently, you've seen this sort of metaphor in this picture before. You can only see about 10% of an iceberg. 10% of the top of an iceberg from the, with the visible eye. But the stuff underneath really, really matters, doesn't it? The stuff underneath really matters. And you can see it as a metaphor for what I'm talking about. That actually we can live a life, we can be like this, we can, people can think of us in one way, but actually, do they actually know what's going on? Actually, do we really know what's going on? I, was, uh, I got my hair cut this week and I was speaking to a lady cutting my hair and she, uh, she asked how I was and I said, yeah, I'm doing okay and told her a couple of things. I said, how are you? And she said, yeah, I'm okay. And I said, well, how's your family? And she began to say, not very well, but then she stopped. She said, no, 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 we're fine, we're fine. And I said, no, go on, tell me, how are you doing? And she said, do you know what? It's been an awful week. And I thought, okay, well, let's work with this. And I, I, she said, uh, my five-year-old has been accused of something that he hasn't really done and it's been really embarrassing and really we're really angry we might leave the school because of it my husband has ptsd and there's some real shocking things going on for him at his work that's brought all these things up that happened i was like wow okay and i said well are you talking to anyone about it 
And she said, you know, he's getting some help now. It's, um, but then she pointed to herself. And she said, but really, it's me that's dealing with this. And I said, well, listen, you're doing a great job. You do not know how much help you are giving him just by being there and opening up to or letting him open up to you. And then after it, I, I well, ju- just after she said that, this little image came to me of a plank of wood. And I thought, actually, I said to her, often we're like planks of wood. It's a random analogy, but you'll, you'll figure out where I'm going. This plank of wood is like how we're doing. We can be quite stable, but then a drip can come down and start affecting that wood. If it's just a drip, though, the wood can cope. If it's a solid piece of wood, it can cope, right? But after a while, this drip, if it keeps dripping and forms into a drench, what can happen is the wood can get saturated with water, right? It can rot and it can break. And she stopped cutting my hair and she said, Jack, look. And she, she had goosebumps on her arm. I'd hit the nail on the head. No one had ever spoken to her about this sort of thing. And then afterwards, she said, can I give you a hug? And she said, I feel that you're meant to come in today. You see, this message that we're talking about, yes, it's for the church. Jesus has come to bring healing and restoration and life to the full, but he's also come for the sick. This is a message that our world desperately needs to hear right now. People do not talk about emotions like they do in the church, and yet we're not actually that good at it in the church either, are we? Let's be honest. Jesus wants to bring salvation. He wants to bring life. This word salvation, in Greek, it's sozo, uh, S-O-Z-O. It means to to save from something, salvation from something, to save from um, sin, to save, to to be healed, um, to bring wholeness. And this is the goal of this series, that we would all experience more salvation, more wholeness, more healing, more restoration. And there's going to be people in this room who have things like, Um, insomnia, headaches, nausea that doctors have not been able to find a reason for. And maybe, I'm not saying this is the case for everyone, but maybe it's not a physical reason. Maybe it is your heart crying out and it is actually your emotions. It's your body. Your body's pretty cool. I I did a degree in anatomy, which I've forgotten. It just comes out at pub quizzes now. Um, But your body is pretty cool. It's really well made and it can tell us when something isn't right. And it can give us a sign. Maybe throughout this series, there's going to be some answers to some long given questions around your health. Um, Others, it might be that we've not grown spiritually for years. And you might think, okay, is that because I've had these emotions that I've not dealt with? Maybe it's anger. Maybe you need to grieve. Maybe you felt you've dealt with something. But actually, the Holy Spirit is going to take you by the hand and say, let's go back there. There's something that happened a week ago. There's something that happened 10 years ago. Let's go there. Maybe someone you need to forgive. It's not okay. You're not going to have life in all its fullness if you say, I'm all right, I won't, I won't go there. Others, it's depression. You know, Jesus cares about all these things and wants to bring healing. And it might mean that we have to go back to the past. And it might get uncomfortable, but we're comfortable with that, right? Jesus can be trusted. And it is worth saying that just like I needed some professional help those years ago, just like my hairdresser's husband needed professional help, some people, there will be these bigger things. And we're not advising in community just to start opening up willy-nilly about everything. We're not saying that. What we're going for is saying that actually being a mature Christian is daily looking and thinking about our emotions. But occasionally, and in this series, there might be some things that that the Holy Spirit leads us to looking at. There might be things that in six months start to come up and you think, actually, I need a bit more help than I can get. And let us know. We'd love to help. We'd love to help guide you to good help. There's lots of good help out there. You know, for some of us, emotions just weren't done growing up. I don't know what your childhood was like, what your church experience was like. Did they encourage emotions? Did you ever chat around the table, have dinner around the table? And did people ask, how are you doing? Or was it more like, shut up, keep going, stiff up a lip? In church, you can stand and sit, but no cheers or or tears. What what were your emotions like growing up? Because our emotions are so important. We need to listen to them. 
And if we need convincing, then we just need to look at God, don't we? We need to look at God, because who here thinks that God is a God who does emotion? Anyone think, good, we're in good company. God is full of emotions, isn't he? That he so loved the world, Father, Son, and Spirit. Before the world, in fact, God so loved that he made the world. And in the Old Testament, we see that God is an emotional God. He gets angry. He experiences jealousy, compassion. He gives his heart away again and again, and his heart is broken again and again. Until he does say, I love this world so much, I'm going to come down and I'm going to rescue it. And he's going to give himself to, to die on the cross. And we see in Jesus that Jesus was emotional. And he laughed and he wept. And he was angry at the people in the temple who who were doing business, and he says, that is my father's house of prayer. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus full of emotion, overwhelmed by emotion. He did emotion. God is emotional, and he's made us in his image. So having emotions isn't just for women. Having emotions is something that makes us all human. To feel, we need to have and we need to attend to our emotions. Because if we don't, if we deny our emotions, then we're denying. And we're not living as image bearers of God. God has given us emotions. So we need to acknowledge them. We need to begin to listen to them. We need to say, hello, anger. We need to say, hello, fear. Hello, anxiety. Hello, hope. Hello, joy. Where have you been? Hello, <laughs> We need to get to know our emotions. We need to cultivate them. Let them grow. Don't be afraid of them. And occasionally, God will lead you to attending to some of the roots of the more negative ones because he wants to bring healing. Now, let's move on to our second main passage today. It's Matthew 13. It's the parable of the sower. And this is Jesus speaking to the large crowds that gathered around him. And he says... Um, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. And lastly, there was the seed that fell on the good soil where it produced a crop 160, 30 times what was shown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So what's Jesus saying? What's the me message about? Well, we know that the soil is our hearts, and we know that the seed is the gospel. It's the good news of the kingdom of God. So Jesus is concerned with the health of our hearts here. And in verse 19, he explains when anyone hears the message, when anyone hears and is open to what I'm saying to them about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. Yeah, that one. Um, so the key to us seeing the kingdom of God in our lives is directly linked to the state of our hearts. And by hard hearts, it, it says in that passage, by hard hearts, we simply mean hearts that aren't receptive to God and what he wants to do in our lives. So what causes hard, hard hearts? Three things. Three things. Number one, we desensitize our hearts through sin. Now, sin causes hardness of hearts. We've all been there doing something we, we probably know isn't the best for us, whether it's taking something, doing something, thinking something, whatever it is, we've all been there. And we come to this thing, often it's at night when no one else is there, we're feeling a bit miserable, maybe it's during the day, whatever, and, and, and we think, oh, it's going to feel good. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to say this thing. And you do it. It feels good. But this Holy Spirit, this little voice is in your ear, in your heart maybe, and it's saying, why would you do that? Why don't you try something else? Why don't you live a different way? And there's this little wrestle, but you do it anyway. And then you say, Lord, I'm sorry for doing what I've done. I, I knew I shouldn't do it, but I'm coming back to you now. Will you take me back? And often you put yourself on the naughty step for two or three days, don't you? As if that's going to buy you back into God's trust and love. 
but he takes you back instantly. Don't listen to those lies. He takes you back instantly. But we're given it again and again, and actually this cycle continues. And over time, you begin to not hear that voice of the Holy Spirit saying, come away with me. Do something different. That won't bring you life. There's another way. And what happens is we're desensitizing ourselves. We're desensitizing our hearts, and that is deadening our hearts. And Paul says the, the wages of sin is death. And we should look at sin, and sin should shock us. You know, like when you're in the countryside, and you're looking at these cows and the, the sheep, and you lean on the fence, and it shocks you. Or when I was younger, I used to hold on to it and then try and grab my brother so I could shock him as well. Sin should shock us, right? But if we are in repeated sin habits, if we are, are in these patterns where we're actually stopping listening to the Holy Spirit anymore, then it can deaden our hearts. It can normalize and our hearts can become hard. And those who, of us here who are in repeated patterns of sin, those who just can't help it, who have been in it for years, who have been prayed for and you just can't get out of it, I want to say there's good news today that Jesus is faithful and just. He forgives you in a heartbeat. But we do need to take sin seriously. Number two, we can disconnect from our hearts through pain. You know, something happens, uh, some news comes that's unexpected in particular, that can cause a lot of pain. But something happens and we can disconnect from our hearts through pain. And our response is similar to what happens when we get a, uh, a physical injury. So say we get a physical injury, the first thing we want to do is stop the pain, right? We might say a few words, but the first thing really we want to do is stop the pain. It really hurts. And you might take some pain medication. You might take some painkillers. And then over the coming hours, coming days, you can lessen them and hopefully you'll make a recovery. But you're trying to numb the pain. And it's the same. It's really similar with our emotions. Something happens in our lives that has shocked us, that has hurt us, that has frustrated us, that has made us sad or angry. And there's a process. The first thing we do is we want to numb the pain. The first thing we want to do is to isolate ourselves. Maybe watch Netflix, binge watch, or take something, or um, might be alcohol, might be burying ourselves in work. There's a whole number of things that we all are prone to do at those moments. And in the short term, some of those things, not all, some of those things are okay because the pain is too much. It's too overwhelming, isn't it? Some things, when, a lo when we've lost a loved one, when something, when a, a, a severe medical condition comes, when we've lost a job or when an injustice happens, the pain is too much to process by saying to someone, can we go on a walk? And then it's done and dusted. It doesn't happen like that. So some of these things are okay in the short term, but the problem comes when that short term becomes a long-term strategy, and that's when we harden our hearts. That's when we harden our hearts and deaden our hearts. And this is what the grace of God does. God wants to take us by the hand and take us on in this series and in the coming weeks and months and for the rest of our lives. He takes us by the hand at his pace and in his time. And he says, do you know what happened that time? Do you know what happened two months ago? Do you know what happened 25 years ago? I want to take you back to that place and I want to bring healing and I want to bring restoration. And so that we can go into the future and we can start to have fun again. Who wants that? Isn't he a good God? Isn't he a wonderful father? And the third way that we can deaden our hearts is by uh, neglect. And now some people are more prone to this, but I think we're all, we can all be prone to this. Neglect, we can forget. We can get busy. We live in such a fast paced of life, we want to achieve, or we just need to make ends meet, or we're one of those people who've always got this list of things to do. And there's never enough time. If you give them five more days, they'll still have a list of things to do. Isn't that funny? And gradually we neglect and distance ourselves from our hearts. And Jesus explains in Matthew 13, this passage in 20, verse 20 to 22, what happens. He says, the seed of the gospel is stopped from taking root. It's choked by our busyness. And we begin to stagnate or drift. And what can happen is we can go through maybe even a decade of life where we've stagnated, where we've drifted. And you're asking yourself, how have I got to this point? How has my relationship got to this point? How has my friendships got to this point? How, have my, how has my health got to this point? How has my job got to this point? How has my life 
got to this point. And what's happened is you've drifted because you've ignored what your heart is saying. And this is the good news, that God is a God of redemption and healing. And he wants to access these areas and bring life. And that's where this good soil comes in. Someone whose heart is open. Verse 23. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. You know, that's unbelievable fruit, isn't it? That's like the Garden of Eden. That's like heaven breaking in. And that's what we want. So that's the question as we start this series. It's going to get deep. It's going to get emotional, literally. And that's all right. But what is the state of your heart? Do you even know? You know, one diagnostic for just telling how we're doing is by asking ourselves, what is the predominant emotion that we've got going on right now? We've all got multiple emotions. Sometimes you don't listen to your emotions. It's just your breakfast and you just need to get out of the house, go around the block and you'll be all right. But what's the predominant emotion that's going on in you? Is it sadness? Is it grief? Is it anxiety? Is it Hope, is it joy? Is it peace? Jesus is knocking at the door of our hearts. Revelation 3.20 says, find the door of your heart and you will inherit the kingdom of God. That is what is at stake here. This isn't something that's just going to make you feel a little bit nicer. Maybe make you wave your hands a little bit higher in worship. This is, do we want the fullness of what God has for us? Do we want to inherit the kingdom of God? If so, we need to pay attention to what's going on. St. Augustine famously prayed, Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. If we want to know more of God, we need to get to know ourselves and our emotions. They're part of how God made us and we don't need to be afraid of them. In the 13th century, Meister Eckhart said, no one can know God who has not first known himself. And another great Saint Teresa of Avila said, almost all problems in the spiritual life stem from a lack of self-knowledge. And they're all saying the same things, that knowing God starts with knowing ourselves. That we are emotional beings made in his image and he cares about all of us, each part of us. So as we draw to a close, can we get the band up and it'd be great to have the ministry uh, team out as well. What's the state of your heart? Just begin to, to think about that. What's been the state of your heart this week, this month, today? Are we willing to let God access every part? of our beings. You know, for some of us, I want to invite us to pay attention to our emotions for the first time. For some of us, this is second nature. You've been doing it. You've been paying attention to your emotions all your life and you're like, Jack, what's all this about? But I think for some of us, you've never really taken seriously your emotions and perhaps for the first time, God has put his hand on something and I just want to encourage you to acknowledge that just by saying hello emotion, hello pain, hello sadness, hello disappointment, hello fear, anxiety, hello joy. Acknowledge what's happening. Get to know your emotions. He can be trusted. He won't leave you broken. God will bring you the fullness of life he's promised. For some of us, yet we're aware of our emotions and today has helped us think, okay, that that thing that happened or this emotion that I've got, okay, God's interested in it. But if you haven't already, I want to encourage you to find a a trusted companion to talk to regularly about your emotions. It could be your spouse. It could be a good friend. Who are you regularly chatting with and saying, how are you doing? How are you really doing? How's your family doing? We aren't meant to go this alone. And for others still, maybe what I've said today and maybe this whole series is freaking you out. And you're like, I can't be... I can't be doing this. I can't lift the lid on these emotions. I'm scared of what's going to happen. I've dealt with it enough and I'm comfortable with the level of spirituality that I've got, the level of closeness and the level of peace that I've got. Leave me alone. (laughs) And you're just waiting to get out that door whenever is uh, appropriate. I want to pray for you and we want to pray for you for courage to go there. 
We want to pray for courage to step into what God has for you. So why don't we stand? We've got a a time now to worship, to encounter God. And I want to encourage you, if something today has resonated with you, to respond. That might be by worshipping with your whole self. That might be by just acknowledging that you've got emotions or it might be by fixing your eyes on the God of emotion and noticing that he loves you with all of himself. It might mean coming forward for prayer and I encourage you to do so straight away. Just come forward if you'd like some prayer straight away, particularly if for you, and this is the funny thing because it takes courage to come and pray for courage and I'm aware of that. But if that's you, come forward. We want to stand with you. We want to pray. Holy Spirit will give you the courage over the coming weeks and months to go where he wants you to go. To be led by his loving spirit so that you can see healing and transformation. Jesus is calling us deeper. I'm so excited about this series. So let's worship him. Let's respond. And I'm going to hand over to the band.